Yeah, that's Alrighty, welcome everybody. Thank you for those of you who showed up to the CSA photo. I know it was really fast. Um, <laughs> we're gonna go ahead and get started. I don't have any announcements today, so I'm just gonna let Christina take it away. Welcome, Christina. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, bear with me. I'm not the greatest at projecting my voice. So if you need me to speak up, feel free to like raise your hand or, or make some some type of signal. Um, but yes, it's great to be here with everyone. Um, I'm going to speak about opioid overdose prevention within tribal communities, specifically some findings from um, part of a grant that I managed that we refer to as the Saving Lives Project. All right, to kind of just touch base on what I plan on covering today, um, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about tribal epidemiology centers uh, in general and, and kind of how we fit within the sphere of public health. Um, then I'll talk specifically about the Great Lakes Intertribal Epidemiology Center, um, which is an organization that I work for. Uh, then I'll talk specifically be specifically a little bit about the grant that I manage, and then I'll specifically get into that Saving Lives Project portion. Okay, so kind of looking at tribal epidemiology centers, or TECs as we sometimes refer to them as, um, they were authorized the Indian Healthcare Improvement Act, um, and the four of the first texts were established within 1996. Um, so initially, this was not permanent legislation, so it had to be reauthorized every year. Um, but with the passing of the Affordable Care Act, uh, this made the Indian Healthcare Improvement Act permanent legislation. So um, that was exciting. And so as a 
Travel Epidemiology Center or TAC. We are funded largely um, mainly through the Indian Health Service, which is part of the Human Health and Services. Uh, and it focuses or it works to provide um, health services for American Indian and Alaskan Natives. Now, TACs are considered public health authorities. Um, and so in doing that, we are able to serve American Indian and Alaska Native people um, by helping to manage public health information systems, investigate disease, um, monitor and monitor kind of infection control and different programs there, um, and also provide emergency response and coordinate with other public health authorities. And those are just a kind of a small segment of what we are able to do. Um, so I mentioned that there were four texts that were developed or came out of that 1996 legislation. Um, well, now we have 12 texts total, um, one for each kind of IHS area or Indian Health Service area. And then we have one that works specifically with urban Indian populations nationally. Um, and that is the Urban Indian Health Institute in Seattle, Washington. Um, all of the techs are nationally networked. Um, the Alaska Tech serves as that coordinating center for everyone. Um, and techs really uh, have, a, a, again, a number of functions. So we serve as an intermediary, um, uh, a trusted intermediary. So we kind of help serve or uh, mediate between federal government, state, um, tribal kind of work within that realm. Um, we also help build uh, capacity at the local travel community level. Um, we also help to address areas of quality, data quality and data access. Um, so we kind of do some education on the local, state and national level there as well. Okay, so now going more into what we do at Great Lakes Inner Travel Epidemiology Center. Um, so we were one of the first four texts that were developed in 1996. Um, and we function as a program of Great Lakes Inter Travel Council, um, or as we refer to it, GLITC. Um, we're big on acronyms. So uh, GLITC <laughs> is a travel nonprofit um, that primarily serves the tribes in Wisconsin. Um, and that was developed in 19, or kind of came about in 1963. So it's been around for quite a while. Um, and as a tech, we are kind of, uh, they are a parent organization and we really end up focusing on supporting tribal communities in their efforts to improve health. Um, and so we do that through a number of different ways, but we work with American Indian, tribal and urban communities really to help provide direct assistance. We create publicly facing documents um, and provide and educate around data quality and access at the national, state and local level. Okay, so um, while our parent organization primarily serves Wisconsin, we, we have a larger reach. So we serve the 34 federally recognized tribes, four urban Indian programs, and three IHS service areas within the states of Michigan, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and then Cook County, the city of Chicago. So um, most of our communities are, most of the tribes in the Bemidji area are Ojibwe, um, but we also do have other tribes. We've got uh, Menominee, Potawatomi, Dakota, Oneida, Dawa, Ho-Chunk. So we've got um, a good amount of um, diversity, and of course, each tribal community is unique and different in what is occurring. And one community is going to look very different from what's happening in another community. Um, and of course, the, the tribes or the reservation or land areas of each community um, 
vary in size, um, generally mostly pretty small or kind of scattered about, as you can see from the map. Um, we are known as the Bemidji area because it's named after the IHS area office, which is located in Bemidji, Minnesota. Um, but you might also see us referred to as the Great Lakes area. So um, both kind of refer to this service area. Okay, so as we work to serve uh, tribal communities and urban Indian areas, we can provide a lot of different assistance and work within a lot of different areas within that, that sphere of public health. Um, this is gonna be no, by no means an exhaustive list, um, but a lot of what we do is around that providing assistance to tribes and urban Indian organizations. So this can be with community health surveys and that can be at any level. We can help with survey development, the data collection, data entry, uh, writing the report. So we can do all of those stages or um, just one or two of those stages, depending on what the community is interested in. Um, we do area and tribal specific health status reports. We just did one the previous year, um, our three state community health profile that we do every five years. Um, but we also can do condition or special reports. We've done um, oral health reports, cancer reports, uh, we can do community readiness assessments. Um, there's just uh, community specific health assessment. So there's really a lot there. Um, we can do work with data dashboards. We did a good amount of that starting with COVID, um, but we're also working on opioid related dashboards as well. We can help communities um, work towards getting public health accreditation. Um, we can provide evaluation services. So this can be um, in the grant writing phase or as they're developing a proposal, we can also evaluate program implementation um, in whatever stage that may be. Uh, we do a lot of health promotion and disease prevention. Um, that can be different materials like fact sheet series, posters, um, ads, radio ads, uh, TV ads that play in the clinic. So a lot of different things. Um, we can also do a variety of presentations around those. Um, we do a lot with public health law development. Um, we've begun offering fentanyl test strips that tribes and urban areas can order through us and we can send to their clinics to kind of um, help collaborate with their ongoing efforts they have. Um, we offer at home FTI, STD testing, so like Hep C, HIV. Um, that again, communities can order through us. Um, and of course, a lot more, pretty much anything you can think of with public health, um, we can likely assist with. Um, another area we focus on is really building the capacity of uh, staff through training. So we um, focus on all areas, so Indian, the IHS health service units, tribes, and the urban Indian um, communities. Um, we were usually abbreviate that as the ITU. Um, so it's open to kind of everyone in our area. Uh, we've done a number of different ones over the past number of years, uh, like evaluation. Um, we've worked with the tech in Seattle to do more of an indigenous evaluation uh, workshop. We've put together a self-paced e-learning course around evaluation. We've done grant writing trainings. Um, we'll do like what we call epidemiology 101 trainings that we'll do in communities um, to kind of give them an exposure and introduction to what epidemiology is. We've done immunization trainings and workshops, zero suicide workshops, hep C, substance use disorder. Um, again, by no means exhaustive, um, Pre-COVID, the majority of these were in person. We are doing some in person, some have been done virtual. So it really just depends. Um, the other big area that encompasses some of those things I spoke about previously, but we also do a lot with direct assistance to tribes. 
Um, for example, in our fiscal year 2021, we awarded almost $1.5 million directly to tribes and clinics uh, within our area for supporting their work that they're doing. Um, in 2020, we received 82 unique different requests for either evaluation support, direct assistance with the project, or any other technical assistance, which is a fairly broad term I'm using there. Um, but then last year, or I should say not quite last year, but in fiscal year 2021, um, we had received 138 unique requests. Um, so, and that's only been growing over the past year. So we've been providing a lot of varied direct assistance to communities. Um, and we'll likely see that continue to increase in the future. And then an important thing we keep in mind with all of the work we do is around data sovereignty. Um, so indigenous peoples have always been data creators. They've always been data users and data stewards. Um, and that information can be any types of facts, knowledge, information that is around tribes, their citizens, their, their land, their resources. Um, so data, the concept of data isn't necessarily new to indigenous communities. Um, and along with that comes the idea of data sovereignty, um, which is that right of native nations to govern and own that data, the government the collection and the application of how that data is going to be used. Um, and this really goes back to and comes out of those treaties between tribes and the federal government, um, indicating tribes as sovereign nations who can really govern how their own tribes, their lands, their resources, their people. Um, and so naturally their data is theirs as well. Um, however, looking um, historically, through different events, actions, policies, et cetera. Um, extensive data have been collected about tribes, but rarely by tribes or for tribal uses. Um, so in this case, you see from the history of exploitation around data and different policies, there can be some mistrust around data and uh, research within communities. Um, especially as when we're looking at some data being collected, it's usually not um, being done by Native communities. It's being owned or utilized by other entities or the state um, and not always easy for tribes to access. Um, for example, like death records, communities sometimes will try to go get death records from they're about their people and they're told they have to pay for it. So we would like to keep all of this in mind and all of the work that we do um, really focuses on the fact that tribes own their data. So we do a lot of community driven, community focused work, a lot of more like community based participatory research. Um, we are open to kind of tribal authority and direction on what they would like from us to do. We keep safeguards in place to ensure that um, tribes data is confidential, private, um, that they have access and ownership to it. We don't complete any work without having data sharing agreements or data use agreements kind of governing our role, that privacy and, and security aspect. And then just a quick look at some of the current grants we have. Um, our IHS funding is the funding that really designates us as a tech. So that is our main source. Um, we supplement that with other funding. At the moment, we primarily have uh, CDC funding, um, but we that usually varies based on what funding is out there and, and how it fits for um, our center and what needs are in the communities. Um, but we also have um, Environmental Protection Agency funding right now. We have, we've had SAMHSA funding in the past, NIH funding, so it honestly kind of varies. Okay, so looking now specifically 
at the grant I manage. The grant I manage is called the Tribal Public Health Capacity Building and Quality Improvement Umbrella Cooperative Agreement. We tend to just call it umbrella or UMB internally because it's very long and I can never say it without taking a breath. Um, but the overall goal of this funding is to reduce and prevent opioid and substance use in tribal communities within our service area. Um, we primarily work to address that through improving tribal public health data and information systems, training and increasing the tribal public health workforce. I'm really helping to build the capacity of tribal public health programs and services. And then in general, just continuing to build partnerships between tribes, between the state and the federal government um, and between us. So kind of working to facilitate all of those partnerships and relationships. Um, this funding does have a number of different supplements under it. Um, so we've got a COVID specific supplement that focuses on addressing suicide prevention, intimate partner violence um, and adverse childhood experiences. We've also got a couple of new supplements that we applied for and were awarded this year. One that's going to focus around increasing tech capacity support to really address drug and opioid um, overdose. And that we're looking to really help kind of partner with communities and really work on um, do activities to help provide tribes with more actionable data around drug and um, opioid use disorder so that they can kind of better inform their programming and respond to the opioid epidemic. The other one is around data modernization. So we're gonna be working with communities um, based on their identified kind of gaps and needs in infrastructure to really help build up that public health data infrastructure. Um, some of the gaps which have kind of come to light with the advent of COVID. Alrighty. Um, so we do, a, I do a lot of different things with the grant, a lot of different areas. We do a lot of capacity building through training. Um, we do a lot of like health education materials, um, a lot with naloxone and providing kits and resources, information, all of them. So a variety of different avenues there, but a large portion of the grant also focuses on um, our mini grant aspect. So we have a mini grant program that we really kind of refer within the communities as the Saving Lives Project. And so with this, we provide funding to tribes and urban Indian centers for short-term projects that address opioid use. Um, and we request that they also include a data quality improvement component or some aspect that's gonna focus around opioid use um, and data. Now, these projects usually run anywhere between um, nine to 12 months. It's really just gonna depend on when the proposals get submitted and when we can get those contracts out. Now it's open to all tribes and urban Indian communities within our area. It's also non-competitive. So um, any community that applies will get awarded funds to work on a project. Um, and then through the funding, there's kind of three main strategy areas that our funding kind of dictates or groups these as. So one is more around data, so kind of strengthening surveillance and public health data infrastructure activities around that, um, evidence-based culturally appropriate health system interventions, that'll be kind of activities that really help build capacity and infrastructure to implement interventions. This can include things like uh, safer prescribing practices, linkage to care, health education. Um, and then we also have an innovative community-based strategies, which is a really nice kind of open strategy that's really driven by the local tribal culture and communities. So they kind of are able to indicate what is going to work best for them in their communities. Um, and this can look like a lot of different things. It can be like cross-sector collaboration between like public health and public safety to improve like tracking and response to overdoses. 
um, or any type of upstream culturally appropriate prevention strategies that are going to address those risk factors. Um, but really, it's ultimately up to our communities to let us know what their needs are and what would best fit that. And we've seen some really great innovative things come out of that. So now I'm going to get specifically into talking about last year's mini grant program as we're just kind of up and running our current years. <clears throat> Um, so looking at 2021, 2000, 2022, um, looking kind of timeline here, we have got out a request for proposals in August of 2021 that closed around the beginning of October that same year. Um, we were able to offer $75,000 per award, um, and we were able to award 22 communities last year. Uh, we had six in Michigan five in Minnesota, 10 in Wisconsin, as well as one in Chicago. Um, so ultimately we were able to provide funding to a total of 19 tribes and three urban Indian programs, which was the most we had been able to award um, since we started this grant, which we are in our fifth of five years. So um, that, was, that was pretty impressive when we were excited to be able to reach that many communities. Um, so what the communities kind of have to select activities that fall within those three strategy areas that I outlined. And of course, we do encourage um, communities to kind of adapt and implement culturally appropriate and relevant activities that will work best for them. Um, you'll see a lot of projects tend to kind of overlap some, some of those strategy areas. But in general, to kind of provide an overview of what types of projects kind of occurred last year. So looking at surveillance and public health data infrastructure, um, we had a project around the creation of a culturally grounded opioid surveillance training manual. So they kind of were able to provide a cultural approach to build capacity around collecting data, interpreting it, um, and then utilizing that data to improve programs and services across different programs and departments and service areas within that community. Um, they, we had some work between pharmacy and clinics. They had kind of built a policy and process around a controlled substance program. And then they were able to link their pharmacy and clinic data systems to really monitor that and do monthly audits, both for quality assurance purposes, but also to see how they could improve those processes um, and to kind of make sure they could ensure the best positive patient outcomes possible. Um, there was a number of projects around data systems and quality improvement. Um, so kind of improving existing data systems, improving data collection and tracking, um, both to kind of look at services and identify gaps um, or see maybe where there's gaps in services, where they could improve services, who they're reaching, um, some, but also just to kind of build up that capacity to have a, a data system to track that information. Um, we also saw the development of like an opioid scorecard with a few different indicators to really evaluate their addiction services. Um, so a lot of different kind of ways to assess where they're at, um, and then also use some of that data both to provide community awareness and track trends to better be able to respond to what's happening. Um, we also saw a community work to kind of gather and collect historical data um, as part of a project to develop a data platform um, in which to kind of be used in prevention programming, but also for participants to be able to create digital storytellings, um, addressing opioid prevention and those types of risk factors. Um, so that was, that's an exciting kind of ongoing project there. Um, and then of course, other things like kind of standardizing and monitoring processes and how data is being collected. 
looking at more of the health systems interventions, um, we saw the implementation of screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment within various different clinic settings to better screen and refer um, or link individuals to care. Um, a lot of different aspects of peer report, peer recovery support systems. Um, so a lot of linkage to care there. Um, and that kind of, we saw across communities, some were working to kind of develop that kind of peer recovery support system in that linkage to care process. Um, a lot of things there were around transportation, um, overdose follow-up, uh, community events and education around what services are available, what overdoses look like, that those sorts of things, um, conducting warm handoffs, making sure people could get to appointments, instituting um, like a no wrong door policy so that commute like an individual could go to any, any department within the community and be connected to care, um, but also building capacity um, for existing systems and identifying like where, where are some gaps, but also how can we build staff capacity? So there were some like peer recovery coach trainings, case management trainings, things to kind of strengthen those systems. Um, we saw some culturally relevant health education materials. So patient materials that were culturally appropriate were designed to be um, included as part of their safer prescribing procedures and making sure patients knew um, all of that important information. We did see a lot of different things around harm reduction, so naloxone training, um, education there. Communities would ensure people had fentanyl test strips or naloxone kits or connecting people to naloxone. Um, we also saw a variety of different policies related to that. So there was one policy around um, pharmacies dispensing naloxone if patients met a certain criteria um, or policies around for every controlled substance prescription, um, they would also give out safe disposal packets so those drugs could be like safely disposed of if there were any left over. Um, and then looking kind of at the broader innovative community-based strategies, um, saw a lot of cross-sector collaborations um, between public safety, public health, um, treatment, um, programs, behavioral health, so and a variety of other partners. Um, one thing we saw was law enforcement referral to care. So um, law enforcement were kind of trained around, or I should say they were trained, but also there are policies put in place so that anytime they responded to an overdose, they would um, be able to refer that individual to a variety of different care options um, and connect those individuals to some follow-up. Um, there wasn't any obligation on the patient's part to continue with the treatment option, but they had that initial outreach connection. Um, we also saw partnerships with public safety around overdose tracking and notification. So officers were trained on information to collect when they were responding to an overdose. That information not only was used to help refer that individual, but to track overdose trends, see kind of spikes, inform leadership in the community of what, what was going on um, and what that looked like. Another community is also interested or working towards integrating overdose alerts within an existing alert system they already have and how they can leverage that. Um, a lot of prevention programming, so a lot of youth prevention programming um, happening within schools. Um, one community has been working on a program called Project Venture, which is one of the only evidence-based um, substance use prevention programs for American Indian Alaska Native youth. Um, and so they've been doing a lot of great work on continuing that, and we're working with them now to start assessing and evaluating um, how that's been going since they've been doing it for at least the past five years in their community. Um, but we also saw a lot of tribal best practices. So these are things that communities and have done um, since the beginning of time. And it's not necessarily have like 
the evidence base that you think of from a Western view, but it's things that work in their community and really connect to their culture because cultural best practices and, and culture really is prevention. So we saw a lot of that integrated as well. So a lot of traditional cultural events, traditional healings, traditional ceremonies, um, a lot of different practices there, but even things just like um, regalia making, ribbon skirt making, um, incorporating kind of the prevention aspect there, they're connecting and learning about their culture, but at the same time, they're also able to kind of get some of that prevention programming as well incorporated. Um, so a lot of the projects really kind of cross those strategy areas. So they kind of are in working in a lot of very various areas. Um, but nonetheless, some common themes kind of have emerged from projects, um, one being that integration of cultural best practices with evidence-based approaches. So, you know, there's things like systems change and safe prescribing practices, um, referral to treatment, like those things are happening that are more evidence-based, but then they're interspacing that with those cultural elements. So drum groups or learning how to sew a ribbon skirt, learning how to bead, doing seasonal cultural activities like ricing for wild rice in like the summertime or, or more in the winter when you do maple syruping. So they're connecting back to their culture and trying to revitalize some of that, um, which cultural engagement and connection is a very strong prevention or preventative factor. So kind of incorporating that with some of the more evidence-based strategies. I saw a number of program evaluation and quality improvement um, in various areas came out. Um, a lot of just tracking to identify gaps in services and where they can improve things or identifying barriers to accessing care. So why are some people being able to access services? Why? Why are others not? How can we mitigate some of those barriers? Um, like I said, I'm working with the community on evaluating how their project venture program is going, and that's an ongoing process. Um, but also we're working with another community on evaluating ceremony and how what effects that has on health outcomes. Um, so a lot of different quality improvement and evaluation are happening. Um, a lot of collaboration. So there's a lot of cross-sector collaboration, different departments, different areas, medical, behavioral health, public safety, law enforcement, um, human services. All these areas are really collaborating to create system-wide change and, and have sustainable programming and policies, procedures happening to really have that change. Um, and then a lot of different infrastructure and capacity building, both on, on a data level in terms of improving data collection, creating data systems, um, tracking that, but also around kind of building capacity for data, data collection, on, you know, understanding how to use and interpret data and what how they can share that back out. But capacity building in terms of um, other areas, a lot of linkage to care. So some infrastructure in developing those linkage to care, capacity building in the sense of providing training or getting staffing to um, have that knowledge to really continue or strengthen that, those linkage to care aspects and learning what gaps are there, how can we provide more recovery services and connect people to treatment and meet them where they're at. So um, a lot of that going on in a variety of ways as well. And so kind of then looking towards, towards the future and, and ways we could kind of see this continuing or growing more, um, it's really highlighted that kind of need or benefits for data platforms and integrated data systems. Um, on some level, communities are kind of building some of that out. We are working with a community around improving their tracking and automating some of that overdose response and, and alerts there and how to be able to 
automate that into more of a data platform and a data dashboard to really have quick, easy access to that information that can then be shared with leadership, that can inform decisions, that can be communicated out to the community. Um, and integrating data is so able to kind of pull all of that together. Um, on our end at GlidTech, we are working on a data platform. Um, we do have an agreement right now with the state of Wisconsin, and we're hoping to eventually expand this out to Minnesota and Michigan, but we have a sharing agreement there. So we'll be able to get travel data from the state and then house it in our data platform so that tribes are able to access their own data when they need it for their purposes because it, because it really is theirs. So that's uh, on our end something we're working on, but also we're working to kind of build that capacity within communities as well to have their own systems and infrastructure there. Um, also the data for culturally competent programs. Um, now kind of data, looking at data around culture can um, maybe not be as instinctive, but it really can help show that importance of culture and certain programming and health outcomes. Um, and there are great ways to kind of go about that in a more of an indigenous evaluation approach to kind of utilizing that to really be able to highlight um, why tribal best practices are so effective and important, um, especially as with many federal grants that that kind of stipulation of utilizing evidence based practices and, and trying to get that support to show that tribal best practices are um, important to be able to fund as well. And we are working a bit with that in terms of our evaluation of ceremony, because um, another area that communities have talked about for a long time is being able to get some of those traditional practices reimbursable through CMS. Um, and so helping to kind of provide some of that evidence base is one of the first steps there. Um, and of course, beyond just using indigenous evaluation approaches, um, really the benefits of having incorporating those qualitative and quantitative measures. It can provide such a great picture of what's going on and really help provide that story that's behind the numbers. So kind of utilizing that whenever possible. That's that. that is uh, about what we've done and kind of what we're learning. We are working on our proposal period right now for our fifth year of the Saving Lives mini grants is currently out. Um, so we're hoping to work with maybe not quite 22 this year, um, but we'll try to get as many as we can and continue some of these um, Some of these communities we've worked with um, across years on the Saving Lives Project, and it's been great to see kind of where they've taken projects and how they've built and expanded on what they have started working on. Um, but in terms of if you're kind of interested in any of the projects that I've talked about today, um, reach out to me. I'm happy to talk about things. And then I've also included our director and some of our other program directors who are responsible for managing our other grants that we have. But any questions for me? I have a question. Uh, so thank you so much. That was really interesting. It was really interesting to hear about like the history of how text came about and how your specific one um, functions and, and the mini grants program. Um, I was really interested that um, the techs have public health authority. Yes. And I, um, I don't know why I didn't know that, but I am fascinated by that. And I'm wondering like how that played out during the pandemic, because I know like our public health system is just is like hundreds of systems, right? And I'm wondering if like the techs also kind of experienced that, like were they putting in place mask orders? Were they deferring to states? Like how did that kind of work? Absolutely. So I think it varied by area because each tech, the area is unique when the tribes in that area are unique and like their relationships can kind of vary. Like a lot of the techs also 
um, are affiliated with like a regional health board as well. So sometimes it kind of comes through that or they have like a medical and like other services attached. Um, in our case, we um, provided kind of insight and we helped um, communities develop some of those policies, but we, um, considering that tribes are sovereign nations, they were able to pass um, resolutions um, to kind of dictate what mandates and orders they wanted in their um, individual communities, which could be um, very helpful because they, they didn't have to abide by state orders. Because um, I know like for Wisconsin, like, you know, we had mask mandate and then the, the Supreme Court overruled that. And so like, then there, you didn't have that mandate, but then tribes could still kind of keep that mandate. And what we do is we support that and we'll abide by whatever um, the tribes want. So the techs were less operating as a public health authority, but more of a like a support for the sovereignty. Yeah, and, and in that case, tribe. yes, we did also help with like contact tracing, all of that. Um, and we gathered, were able to gather all of the COVID related data and we did weekly reports out to, to leadership on what, what that looked like to help kind of inform their decision making. Um, so I'd say it was a mix of both dependent on the topic, but it also, I think, depends on the area. So interesting, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just have a quick question about, well, first of all, uh, thank you for all the presentation. It's, it's like amazing work you're doing. Um, I am curious about if you could talk more about indigenous evaluation approaches and what does it look like? Like you talked a little bit about ceremony, but I, I'm not sure how. What oh, absolutely, doing. absolutely. Um, so I'm definitely not, and I'll, I'll just preface this thing, I'm definitely not an expert in indigenous evaluation, um, but it's really more about incorporating those indigenous ways of knowing. So a lot of, um, in a lot of indigenous cultures, like the primary mechanism for learning is through storytelling. So they didn't they didn't write a lot of things down. It was stories were passed on from generation to generation. And that's where how a lot of the tradition is kept. Um, you can't just necessarily read about everything. So um, it encompasses that in a sense, because it's that indigenous way of knowing, which is through like stories, through um, engaging in traditional practices um, and then learning about the process through that, learning about stories from elders, those sorts of things. So it's usually less focused around having like a strict like logic plan. Things are more viewed in a, in a circular sense because um, that that's a, a lot of what the way of thinking in native cultures is it's not quite as linear, it's much circular, um, usually involving, in some sense, incorporates elements from the medicine wheel, um, which is the different directions, but also different colors. It all has different meanings with different time periods of life, um, but also come next back to like your, your spirit, the mind, the body, emotion. Um, so all of that is intertwined. So for example, like approaches for indigenous evaluation might include, rather than maybe like a survey on how something went, talking about it or doing um, like a talking circle so people can like discuss how they felt about things um, or photo voice has been used. So they'll go out and they'll take photos of things that like represent their experience in a program or an activity and be like, this is what this means to me. And then they'll talk, they'll tell the story about it. Um, we've also utilized digital storytelling or like video production. Um, so digital storytelling is like a three to five minute video that individuals actually will write their own script, choose what like music um, or pictures or images they want included. And We've used it to kind of in the past and, and others have used it so that people can talk about a program. They can talk about like how it impacted them per personally or like their journey within the program or how the program, they feel the programs impacted their community. So those are like smaller scale, like individual ways um, that they can talk about what they've experienced and what it means to them and why it's important. 
Um, but also we've done like larger video productions, which is like less individual focus, but still involves more of that like storytelling, people sharing their perspectives, seeing like the programming and like what's happened. And, and that's a bit of a, a larger long-term, more costly um, approach, but that one is helpful as well. Thank you so much. Um, I think you just addressed a lot of this. I was just going to share uh, before I came to Michigan, I was working at the Michigan Public Health Institute. And we, before I left, I was working on a project where we were having conversations with community workers, community organizers from marginalized groups and their engagement with public health nonprofits around health equity. Mm -hmm. And one of the sort of brightest themes, particularly from talking with indigenous folks was like, we don't really care for your definitions of health. Mm -hmm. And we also like the benchmarks that you set to get funding, those don't make sense to us. And they sort of foreclose our opportunity to have impact on our people sort of immediately and then going on into the future. And so I was just sort of wondering how that shows up in your in your work. Absolutely. Um, so yes, thank you for sharing that. And I, I have noticed, definitely heard and noticed elements of that as well, too. Um, yeah, with funding, I know it's like a big like issue with some of like the stipulations or like how certain things have to be done or like what benchmarks they're looking for. Because you're right that a lot of times communities will be, you know, say like that, that's not how we view this topic or like we don't, you know, we don't look at it like that. Um, and I've noticed that a lot with more of like the tribal like best practices when you're looking at like what usually funding dictates or like what type of strategies and activities you should do there. Like that, that doesn't like fit for us or like that doesn't make sense. That's not the way they learn or that's not congruent with like their culture. Um, and so I know like a lot of times people are hesitant about they're like, oh, it's like another survey because like, they're like, that's not like the best way. Like we don't just write things down. Like, you know, it's it's more about that process and that, that story element. Um, so we, we try to listen as much as we can and um, try to find ways to, I guess, bridge that gap as much as we can between like the funder restrictions and like what, our communities know is gonna work best for them um, and try to do um, a fair number, like some as much like education around that as possible. Just, just wanted to follow up on that comment. Um, other, so I noticed there's one theme that is, for example, increased access to care. Mm -hmm. And I'm understanding this our like the not not a not a traditional care access, it's just access to hospitals. Are there ways to support the more traditional healing um, practices that already co communities practice? Um, is there like does the funding mechanism one way or another support that that capacity building? <laughs> or yeah, no, absolutely, yeah, and in some in some degree, and that's where we have to get creative because. Um, there's not a lot of like specific funding. And actually when we were just like met as a department, like a, we our center met like a few weeks ago to do like strategic planning. And we, one of the things we talked about is there's really not enough, there are not grants out there that are really focused more around like traditional and cultural healing. Um, it's usually considered like, you know, a side element or, I know I've had many conversations with my funder when communities are like, I wanna do this. And I, and I like go back to the funder and I'm like, this is what they want to do. This is why they want to do it. Like it's important because like the funding that the CC gives to us indicates that they, we can't use funds on direct clinical services. So then I have to engage in that conversation with the funder and be like, this is not, this is not clinical services in the way you're thinking. Like this is traditional and an important element that can be integrated with with more conventional or medical approaches. So um, it's not, there's not as much funding as we would like, but it's something we work to try to support um, as much as possible with the funding within the scope we can. And if we can't necessarily support there, we try to support through other like TA, if we can't provide direct funding, we'll try to support and provide that 
capacity in other ways um, as much as we can. But it's, yeah, it's an area that we've definitely been trying to, to have a greater impact in. All right, thank you, Christina. Oh, thank you. I don't know. All right, see you all in two weeks. <laughs>